The Unshackled Waves, episode 263. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. As you know, one of the Patriot organisations we have covered extensively is the Proud Boys. It was founded in 2016 by alt media personality Gavin McGuinness to be a Western fraternal men's organisation. The Proud Boys have been the main target of Antifa violence and media slander in the United States. They are a worldwide fraternity organisation which has chapters here in Australia. The Proud Boys were deplatformed from social media after the Proud Boys chapter in New York they were subjected to to political persecution after a confrontation with Antifa at the end of 2018. Gavin McGuinness stepped down to protect the Proud Boys. The Proud Boys elders they elected as their new chairman, Enrique Tarrio. He's a Cuban-American businessman from Miami, Florida, who has seen the Proud Boys return to full strength and resume their political activism. Lately, the Proud Boys have held two rallies in the city of Portland, Oregon, in an effort to draw attention to the fact that this is where the modern Antifa movement was formed and where it plans its uh, domestic terror activities. To talk about the return of the Proud boys and to cut through the fake news and smears against them we are lucky to be joined by Enrique himself for today's show. Enrique welcome to the show. Thank you sir so much for having me today really excited about this um read your article and um I really wanted I really wanted to, to interact with you after reading your article. I'm glad you liked it because as I uh, said to you at the time it took it was a week after the the Portland anti-domestic terror rally, and it took me a week to just get all of the, the facts in there the, uh, to, to research it thoroughly. And I said to you that it's so hard to, to research and do real news now because the search engines always uh, spit out all the fake news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I think right now, um, and I check it, I check it probably three or four times a day. I check... Uh, Proud Boys. I check Proud Boys Portland. I check. I check my name to see what what what's coming up on the search, and like right after Portland, it's just like a barrage of like f fake news. First first article that comes up is how um, they caught me on like some hidden camera or whatever, which actually wasn't a hidden camera, um, saying that oh this is not the event for a fourth degree. And what I meant by that was this this is a, this is an event that we're just going to go in, and if they go ahead and they attack us, we were just going to put our hands up. Um, was basically what I was saying with that. So yeah, it's just flooded with fake news. So I'm happy. I'm happy somebody just stops and is like, okay, let me let me decipher what's uh, what's true and what's not. You know, you don't see that anymore. No, unfortunately not. Or you have to actively go and seek it and you mentioned the the websites you basically have to know which websites to go on such as uh, zero hedge or the the gateway pundit otherwise it's not going to show up in a search engine i i don't know how google well like we kind of already have seen how google works how their al algorithm works um it favors the left uh immensely again speaking about portland and, and like search results you know uh basically all we did was show up bend the knee in prayer, uh, bend the knee in prayer, put our flag on the ground, sing our national anthem and leave. We were there for about 20 minutes. Well, over the past year, the, the mainstream media and of course uh, many uh, politicians have done their, their most to destroy the Proud Boys. Uh, now you're the chairman of the, of the Proud Boys. I should note that you're not the dictator because all the uh, chapters are autonomous. Uh, but obviously you started as as just an ordinary member of the Proud Boys. So obviously they had a big profile initially because Gavin McGuinness, a big uh, media star. And yeah, so what, what attracted you to uh, the organization? I've been involved in politics for quite a long time uh, since, since I was very young. And um, I've, I was always against groups, right? So... It was strange that I joined a group, right? Because the first time, uh, the per uh, first time a proud boy came up to me and was like, "Hey, do you want to join?" I kind of knew who Gavin was. I wasn't 
I can't say I was a fan, like a, like I watched his show or whatever. I would watch YouTube clips of Gavin, hilarious. But then they told me the name, and I was like, oh, mm, yeah, I kind of don't want to join this. But then that night I did my research, and I saw a whole bunch of false articles that I can tell that they were fake, so that interested me a lot. So by pure coincidence, like two days after that Proud Boy approached me, I had to go to a, um, a dinner um, for a local politician that was running, and that same Proud Boy was at that event. Uh, went outside to smoke a cigarette with him, and he's like, man, you sure you don't want to join? And I'm like, you know what? Um, I read about you guys, and I kind of like what the tenets are about. Uh, what really drew me in was uh, the glorify the entrepreneur. Right. Um, I'm a small. I was. I'm a small business owner now. I've lost two businesses to this, but I was a small business owner, and that kind of like really appealed to me because one of my core beliefs that I was raised with was the fact that like you kill your masters, kind of is is whatever we, uh, was always taught, not to be taken literally, but kind of not to have masters, and that includes like government entities. Uh, bosses, managers, and things like that. So, like the tr path to like true freedom is taking control of your future and being a business owner, an entrepreneur. Now, you're based in Miami, and you grew up in what's known as Little Havana, which is is where the the Cuban exiles who escaped the the Castro a communist regime and the Cuban Americans. They're very much I admire them a lot because. They, they left communism, they appreciate the, the freedoms and opportunities that they've got in the United States, and yeah, they can't wait for the day that well, the, the rest of their countrymen are free as well. And that's how I was raised. I was raised very anti-socialist, anti-communist, very conservative from the beginning. I mean, the first time I voted, I voted for Bush's second term. So I've always pretty much i mean there's there's a, there's a few times that i've voted for independents or libertarians but i've never voted left wing at all at all um so i was i was raised to do this did you uh, were you able to make it to the uh when fidel castro dies the the celebrations in miami were you there yes and it's uh funny that you bring that up nobody's ever brought that up when castro died which um just to give you some pretense on that so Miami has celebrated his death, like, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 times before he actually <laughs> died, because we would always get, like, news stories that he died, and everybody would, everybody would go to the streets, right, and just party, and then we find out, oh, he's still alive, oh, you know, I met one of our best, like, one of our tightest members in our, we call, our Miami chapter, we call it the Vice City chapter, uh, it expands through three counties, and in our Vice City chapter, that day, I met one of our most dedicated members at that, de it was, I can't even say demonstration, because it was so last minute. Like, the news broke, and like 10 minutes later, people were on the streets with pots and pans. So, had a great time. We were out there, I was like at, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night, I was in bed sleeping, and uh, my, I woke up my girlfriend, and I'm like, yo, hey, we got to go over there, you know? And um, we're out in the streets till like 5 in the morning. I think definitely Cuban Americans, they, they win the prize of uh, best refugees to the United States. I agree with that 100%. 100% we, because we already come in, it's not that we come in with American values as much as we come in from knowing, you know, the dangers of socialism and communism. So we come in and we kind of just, on that flagpole, we bring down the Cuban flag and we kind of go ahead and we raise the American flag, which is what my grandfather did when he got here. We've been through it. So we're seeing it with left-wing politicians in this country, with Democrats specifically, where they're, they're opening up to socialism, you know, and that to us is extremely dangerous. Yeah. I mean, well, us, when I say us, it's really Americans. It's, it's, it's really dangerous to Americans to even toy with the fact uh, that we would have socialists in our, in our government ranks. Well, the young people today, they most of them were born after the Berlin Wall fell, so they've got no idea what, what it's actually like. If they continue on this path, they're definitely going to find out. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're going to find out. They're going to find out the hard way. Um, 
you can vote your way into socialism, but you're going to have to shoot your way out of it. Yeah, that's how it's normally done. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, you were politically active before uh, you joined the, the Proud Boys. Now, obviously, based on what you're, you're wearing on the show tonight with, it's a play on the, the Make America uh, Great Again hat as the same type. Oh. It says, make commies afraid of rotary aircraft again. And your shirt is a Trump 2020 shirt, except it says, because fuck you twice. <laughs> your viewers, your viewers are like, oh, that's a nice Trump shirt. And I was like, and they're like, oh, it's not that nice. <laughs> now, obviously, when Trump ran for the Republican nomination, there were 16 candidates uh, in total. You obviously followed the primaries closely. Was Trump your first choice, or did you have another candidate? Trump was my first choice off rip. I even have, well, not anymore. I don't have it anymore, but on my original Facebook account, I had, uh, in 2012, he had like this exploratory campaign. And I actually had uh, a couple posts already supporting the president in 2012 when he was thinking about, about running for president. But I've been with him since like day one. I love Ted Cruz, but I knew I knew off rip who was going to win that nomination. And obviously, your home state of Florida, they voted for Trump in the Republican primary over the the local uh, Cuban American senator Marco Rubio. Yep, that that was that was actually a surprise for me. I thought Rubio was going to take Florida, and he actually lost by double digits, which was un unprecedented you know marco's love down here not as much anymore but marco's love down here so that came as a big surprise that a new york politician not politician but a new york candidate blew him out of the water i mean he was a part-time florida resident at mar-a-lago yeah but i mean he wasn't marketed during that time he wasn't marketed he wasn't marketing his florida his part-time residency in florida he was just he was just being trump which is why he won now let's return to the proud boys now obviously i know because you know, i've researched it myself i i know the local proud boys here in australia wikipedia describes it as a neo-fascist far-right organization that promotes political violence which is what's well, basically slander now you mentioned the the fourth degree the the degrees are known as uh hazing rituals so i'll just give you the floor at the moment to explain what are the four degrees it's a regular question that we always get so our first degree is basically repeat our credo and if you want to know what that is if your viewers want to know what that is i encourage you to look into proudboysusa.com and do a little bit more research so our second degree is uh, is more of a frat boy hazing ritual, which consists of five guys beating your ass until you say five breakfast cereals. It's not that serious. I mean, we don't go soft on you, but it isn't that serious of a thing. It does bring bonds with with our local chapters. And like It puts you guys together because you're laughing after. Your third degree is your tattoo. You get a tattoo that says Proud Boys anywhere on your body it doesn't have to be visible or anything like that and then our fourth degree is probably like the most controversial one and they always like to say that it's a thing of violence and that is absolutely not true and that has never been true the fourth degree consists of a hardship so an example that i always give is how i got my fourth degree so the way that i got my fourth degree is i um during the events, we had a hurricane that came by in Texas by the name of Hurricane Harvey. And me and uh, another member of my chapter woke up one morning while the hurricane was still on the ground in Texas. We loaded up the truck, we put a boat on the trailer, and we were out there for five days doing water rescues. That is what granted me my fourth degree. Although you can't, it's, it's not like you get multiple fourth degrees you get a fourth degree and that's it but here's a perfect example of, of another hardship so when i was in portland on june 29th last year i got an explosive thrown at me where i got hit with shrapnel where it went Yikes. into my neck and into my arm so those are two instances where you know i got a fourth degree 
Uh, I would have gotten the fourth at that point anyways, but it just means a hardship. It doesn't mean fighting. It doesn't mean any anything like that. It just means a hardship for the Brotherhood. Yeah, it's not seeking out some random Antifa supporter and punching them. Okay, so here's another thing that a way that you can't get a fourth degree. So this will expel that myth. You can't go looking for a fourth degree. You can't be like, oh, I'm going to show up and I'm going to instigate something and then something's going to happen to me and I'm going to get a fourth degree. That's not how it works. Absolutely not how it works. Like if you're a firefighter, you don't uh, win a bravery reward for starting the fire yourself and putting it out. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, my other question was, it's described as a misogynistic, uh, patriarchal uh, organization. Mm -hmm. Why does it choose to only admit uh, men? Really because of like the, our core activity. It's a men's group because we, go to the, we get out of the house and we go to the bar and we discuss things with the boys. Right? It's like it's that Saturdays are for the boys saying. So what ends up happening is we go out once a month with the guys and we drink, you know, and it's not like, it's not like the women thing. Cause we have, we have another, um, group called the proud boys girls. Women can join that, but it's not that it's a misogynistic thing because if it, if it was like women's clubs across the country would be sexist also. <laughs> it's just, that's how men, when men get together, they talk about different things. So we wanted to have a men's group. We didn't want to have women in there. And it's not because we think of women as less. Women are, they are our equals. You're not getting together to, to drink and, and dream up, plan ways to oppress women. That's not what happens. And we're, we don't want to, we also don't want to get together and plan weddings. <laughs> you know, that's like, honey, what are we going to do for the wedding? What kind of roses? Like, I'm just trying to hang out with the boys today. It's once a month. You know, the other 29 days are our family days and stuff like that. So we just want to get out of the house for one day. Now the Proud Boys became uh, quite visible, probably beginning in, in 2017, because not only uh, you identify from the, the MAGA hats, but also the, the Fred Perry uh, polo. It, it was basically patriot free speech rallies, just people wanting to uh, demonstrate how proud they were to be American, but since uh, Trump's election, the far left in the United States has become even more radicalized. And we've seen Antifa, obviously it started in Portland with Rose City Antifa, but it's spread everywhere. And because before Trump got elected, they said he was Hitler and a fascist. And so anyone who supports him is a fascist. And they believe that you have to use violence against so-called fascists. So simply waving American flags, saying you are for free speech, you were deemed a fascist. And so, well, the Proud Boys weren't official security, but were sort of making their presence there. And uh, because, uh, like, obviously physical fitness and uh, health is, is an important thing, obviously Proud Boys were the, the best at making sure the, the rest of the group were protected. We don't go to like events to provide security under like official capacity. We just happen to be there because we want to defend this country and defend free speech. We put ourselves like, like when, when the far left goes ahead and decides to get violent, we put ourselves in harm's way. How do I say it? We put ourselves in harm's way, not even like really thinking about it. Like we, it kind of just happens like that black and yellow just magnetizes to build that wall between the rally goers and the violent protesters. So it just comes naturally for us. That's why they say, that's why some people get the misconception that we're some type of like security group or militia or anything like that. We just don't want to see anybody get hurt and we promote self-defense. And if that bothers anybody, that's fine. We're not going to apologize for that. We're never going to apologize for that. Now, whenever uh, Antifa showed up at these Patriot events and uh, the Proud Boys made sure that they were kept at arm's length, that was the, the media narrative then became, or oh, wherever the Proud Boys goes, violence follows. And this is, the, the media does the same thing in Australia. If there's a Patriot rally and, well, we don't, re we don't have Antifa here, we have a group called the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism, they always counter protest, have to be held back by police. It's that... Basically, you're blamed for provoking 
this response. It's it's a form of or victim blaming. It's basically the same as saying to a girl, "Oh, well, you shouldn't have worn that uh, short skirt if you didn't want to be yeah. assaulted." Yeah, of course. And you know what? I I really don't care what they have to say if they want to. If they want to make that spin for clicks, fine. Let them promote us. That's cool. We'll we'll just keep we'll continue to grow. If my if the mere presence of Proud Boys stokes violence in the hearts of people that are already violent, that's fine. We're going to continue to show up. I'm not afraid of what the media has to say. We've been slandered. I've been called a white supremacist. I've been called Nazi, Hitler, all sorts of stuff. It, it doesn't bother me. It's marketing for me. Now, the media slander campaign really turbocharged uh, after the uh, New York uh, Proud Boys confrontation with uh, Antifa. Now, they were attending a, a Gavin McGuinness talk at the New York Metropolitan Republican Club, where he, he reenacted a, a Japanese assassination of a socialist politician on, on live TV. I'm not going to pronounce the, the Japanese names because I'll, I'll get them wrong. But they were under police yep. escort Gee. at the end. And so all these precautions were taken, yet uh, it was for Antifa appeared out of nowhere. And of course, uh, the Proud Boys didn't know what they were there. And so they defended themselves and i think the whole confrontation lasted less than 10 seconds because the situation was then deemed safe they and i'm gonna defend my guys you know a lot of people ask me oh well they were convicted yeah they were they're they're basically political prisoners i mean they're not prisoners yet but they'll basically be political prisoners in october because this was politically motivated the police were there they saw exactly what happened they saw that Antifa threw a glass bottle at our guys, and our guys defended themselves. And again, we're not going to apologize for it. You know, we're going to fight for our guys. We're going to fight for appeals. We're going to go ahead, and we're going to we're going to continue to push this until until we can't push it anymore. And we're going to continue going to our events. We're going to continue being who we are. We're going to continue going to the bar and drinking beer. But they weren't at fault here. They were innocent. They were innocent. If this would have happened in Florida, a judge wouldn't have even picked up the case. A judge would have tossed this case out. This is politically motivated by the governor and the New York City AG. Yeah, I mean, you had the, right. the mayor, the mayor uh, Bill de Blasio, and the governor, Andrew Cuomo, saying, you know, the, the police need to investigate this. We need to uh, make sure that this political violence can't happen, basically ordering the police to investigate. And the absurd thing was is that they never tracked down the, the four Antifa instigators. They didn't cooperate with police. And so they basically, they ended up, there was nine, they were originally called the New York Nine, but they could only really uh, make charges stick to two of them. Because there were no victims, they, they charged them with attempted assault. They, um, oh, well, they charged them with attempted assault. They convicted them of the assault charges, but... Um, something that hasn't been spoken too much in the media is um, the jury found them justified in the assault. So basically what they said is it wasn't self-defense, but they went overboard. Even though the police, was, the police were on the stand and said that there was no physical injuries to the parties there, uh, the parties refused medical service, they refused to identify themselves, and they left. You know, so the cops are like, I mean, this is New York. Um, they see fights all the time. They're used to, this tells you that they're used to letting these parties go, mm. right? So this tells you even more that this is a politically, it was right before the election, by the way. A lot of people don't remember that. It was right before uh, Cuomo's um, re-election campaign, which I don't know why he, how he continues winning. He's driving that city to the ground. It's ridiculous and it's a shame. And again, we're just going to continue to fight it and we're not going to change who we are because of it. Now, at the time that happened, Gavin McGuinness was set to, to tour Australia. It had been heavily promoted for quite a while. He even uh, came on, on my show. But uh, in response to this New York confrontation, there was a petition launched to deny him a visa to, to enter Australia, even though he'd never committed uh, any crime. And that video compilation put together by uh, Vic Berger, which basically puts all the sort of exaggerated absurd the fuck things I'm just tweeting back and forth with them right now i personally found my sock twitter account right now and they're trying to get it banned what what horrible things did you say on it 
Oh, I didn't say anything. It was, it was quite funny. He was like, oh, this is uh, Enrique Tario's Twitter account. And, like, I have it, I have it like, really hidden, and it says, like, parody account for Enrique Tario. <laughs> and I just put, like, the Scooby-Doo thing that says, ro ro <laughs> yeah. Let's see who but, you really are. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's, uh, they started that petition with Gavin, and um, they're essentially denying him to go, to go into the country. So we, we've gone from deplatforming in social media to, like, deplatforming from an entire country. Well, that campaign against uh, Gavin, it was, it was done by a journalist, uh, Rick Morton, who is employed by that uh, far-left uh, media organization, News Corporation. Uh, his yeah. uh, coverage uh, began when, because the Proud Boys in the state of Queensland, they teamed up with another patriot group called the True Blue Crew against uh, this sexual... LGBT education program called the Safe Schools Program. They held a rally against that and they got one of the the local senators, uh, Fraser Anning, to speak there. And this uh, journalist, Rick Morton, wrote that uh, Fraser Anning speaks at neo-Nazi rally. And he's, the only justification he had for labeling it that is because there was a person who had at some point been associated with the True Blue Crew in another state and had been charged with threatening to blow up the local uh, trade union hall. And so that was his his link there. Yeah, they always want to link things together, but perfect example of links that Antifa doesn't want to make, or they celebrate it, is that we had a firebombing attempt here at a ICE facility, an immigration facility, uh, by an Antifa member, by uh, a member of the John Brown Gun Club. And... The media spun it for a couple hours, and it was done. Here comes us to show up to Portland. It was trending on Twitter for longer than anything I've ever seen. Um, it was trending for t about 24 hours. You know, usually trends on Twitter only last about, like, maybe 10 hours, 12 hours. But it's crazy that, you know, a journalist has that much influence and power in, uh, in local politics. And it's... I have hope because the reason why they have that power, they're losing it. I believe that we're winning this culture war. I believe that we're we're making a difference in like regular everyday people and they're just gonna keep getting pissed off. You know how pissed off they're gonna be when the president wins in 2020? When this president right here wins in 2020, they're gonna be pissed off. If you see, if you think they're crazy now, wait, wait two years. Wait two years. Well, you can add to that uh, how pissed off Google and Facebook are going to be. Yep. All those millions wasted, all that money lobbying is going to go down the drain in November of 2019. Now, another consequence of the New York uh, 9 uh, investigation was that the Proud Boys were uh, deplatformed from Facebook and Instagram. Earlier on, they'd been... Uh, banned uh, from Twitter, which really affected Proud Boys uh, recruitment. And well, I know in Australia, at least, there was uh, a lot of members of the, the Proud Boys. They were supportive of the organization, but they were just like, dude, I, this is too much with my work and family. Like, it's nothing personal, but I've just got to uh, withdraw. And so the, the Proud Boys really took a, took a hit from ba basically all the, the social media companies uh, ganging up on you. We did take a hit. I'd say it took us a little while to adapt to that hit. We're back at full steam right now. Um, people know where to find us. People know how to Google us, the website. You know, and I'm not, I can't tell you that I'm mad at those people that, that, you know, felt like they wanted to put their families first, you know, because that's really what we're about. We're, you know, I, I have people that are like, oh man, I'm so sorry. I can't come to the meeting. I'm like, don't apologize for that. Like, you know, cause, cause they have to go to like dinner with the wife or whatever. We always put those things first, and that's that's kind of what's different about us. We don't take ourselves too seriously, even though we take what we do seriously. Across history, history of the world, people that make a difference, like activists that make different uh, make a difference. Not all proud boys are activists, though. Some pro most most proud boys actually just want to just get out of the house for a weekend and drink beer. The history of the world, people that go against like the establishment are usually labeled like the dregs of society, you know, and they're kicked off like social media, they get kicked out of restaurants and all of that. And they always end up winning somehow.
Like the non-violent ones always end up winning. The violent ones usually die off. But the non-violent ones usually just continue and thrive and win. And that's what we're doing. We're adapting every day. They've deplatformed us off of everything. We went ahead. We got on our own platform. Now we use a third-party software uh, made by uh, some guy that's on the run from the government, of, of the Russian government. We have so solutions like Parler, uh, Telegram, credit card processors have thrown us off, PayPal. We've made our own credit card processor and we're currently beta testing uh, a PayPal competitor that we have in the works right now. Thanks. Well, that demonizes us, you know? We're literally building our own platforms from the ground up. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get an update on, on how that goes because who knows, we may need to use it here at the Unshackled in the, in the future. Um, we'll be releasing that soon. We already have the credit card processing system up. And uh, I'll give you, when we sign off, I'll give you the URL so you can push it um, and, or use it yourself. You know, you could use it for personal, you could use it in Australia, obviously. You could use it for personal reasons, you could use it for your business, you could use it for your e-commerce store. We got it all taken care of. Nice. Now, I mentioned that obviously a lot of Proud Boys felt they, they had to, to quit after the, the slander campaign following the New York Nine, but the, the most high profile one was Gavin uh, himself. He thought that him stepping away would alleviate the, the persecution of them and also because, well, he was being terrorized in his own neighborhood by like neighbors who said that he was running a, a fascist organization and his wife, who he'd been with for, for many years, I, I watched the, the ABC Nightline segment and you could tell that, you know, she was very upset about what happened and you could tell that, you know, Gavin, it's sort of, I need to look after you, you first. Even though he is, a, he is a big star worth millions of dollars, he's he's still got a family and he's, and he's human. It's not nice. Person. I can tell you Gavin did help the New York guys by stepping down. It did help them immensely because it proved, it proved that we're autonomous, right? It completely proved that we're autonomous. Um, and like you said, there's a big difference between a chairman position, like a dictator or a president, a president or, or a dictator has, you know, like executive powers where they can go, Hey, this is what I want you to do. If you don't do it, you're out. Or with no threat, this is what I want you to do. And I can't do that. Like, if I do that, I think our guys would have a shit fit if I told anybody what to do. I don't involve myself in personal chapter business. I really don't care about that. I just try to organize what we have as best as I could to the best of my ability. And I've made this a full-time job. This is This is... At first, I was like, damn, this is my life. And now I see it and I'm like, damn, I'm, I'm pretty happy. You know, I'm really happy with, with what I'm doing. I'm a lot more content now than I was before. You had a, a large uh, vacuum to fill because there was a, a brief period of anarchy. Uh, one of the, the former Proud Boys, uh, Jason Van Dyke, he, or he's a, a lawyer and decided to make himself chair and that he owned all the, the Proud Boys intellectual property. So that looks mm. a, a bit I, more of a mess. I think there's uh, um, also there's a misconception of how that happened that actually happened exactly how is it how it was, it was supposed to for legal reasons. We had um, Jason Van Dyke take the wheel for about 48 hours until we did the actual voting and everything came in. And I actually wasn't in the position to run. I didn't want to run. I didn't, I didn't want the position. And, um, everybody kind of just put my name in the hat and I was like, you know what, forget it. I'll, I'll say it. I'll, I'll run for the position. I didn't want, I didn't even want the structure period. And, um, I ended up getting the chairman position just from one day between 24 hours of, I'm like, okay, I'll run for the position to actually happen. It was 24 hours, which I didn't think I was going to even win. So, um, I think there's a little bit of, a of information out there that was uh, a little false when it came to Jason. I talked to him here and there, but uh, he had no no bad intentions or anything. It's just that's how it had to work out. So in order for us to have the structure that we have today. Yeah, uh, you could tell that I got that information from probably one of the fake news articles. Yeah, 
and it's it's not it's not difficult because sometimes it's it's really difficult to decipher what's going on and what's not. Here's the thing: even like some right wing, um, and this kind of shows you who we are. Um, even some right wing outlets don't like defending us much. You know, it's not like we're not we're not disliked by the left or the right. We're disliked by the establishment, the establishment conservatives, the establishment left, and obviously the far left hates us. And it's really because of how effective we are at doing what we do. Well, there was a lot of outrage that uh, you were at the Conservative Political Action Conference this year, and much was made of your photos with Senator Ted Cruz, uh, Rick Scott, the Florida governor, and and Donald Trump Jr. Uh, they did they know like who you were? There was no like panic afterwards, like oh no, we've been. There's no panic at all. Um, That's great. I can't tell you. I can't tell you. It's like I, I sat there and had like a whole cocktail with them and spoke to them about uh, how we're gonna play golf or, or whatever. It was, it was a simple conversation. I got to talk to Don Jr. about like the censorship of conservatives and Ted Cruz. I got to briefly mention the the issues that we have with Antifa. You know, it's not it's not like some big conspiracy theory. There's a story out there that said that I was going to the White House, that the president had, like, personally invited me to the White House, which I'd love that. Like yeah, I'd love that'd be great. It. I wouldn't. You know what? I wouldn't doubt that he'd 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 do it. Um, but but it just ha hasn't happened. But it sounds like Ted Cruz, given that you said you spoke to him about Antifa, he was the, the first one to put the intention to move the motion in the Senate to list Antifa as a, a terror organization. And if you've like played a part in alerting him to that, then that's fantastic. I mean, I guess like if it was like a 0.01% of the push, I think what really pushed him was um, the Andy No situation. That was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. Nobody wants to see that. And and shortly after, a couple of days after uh, the Andy No situation, I put out a petition with zero platform, no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter, no nothing. I have, I think I have like 700 subscribers on my Telegram, and we were able to get together 45,000 signatures out of the hundred thousand that I needed with no platform. So like, imagine if we had the platform, we would have had an official response. And then just like about uh, a week or two after we started that petition, Ted Cruz went ahead and uh, and proposed the bill. The great thing about the, well, under your leadership, uh, the, the Proud Boys uh, bouncing back, it's also pleasing that there's been scrutiny on Antifa finally. I mean, there's obviously the the Antifa suicide attack on the, the ICE facility in, in Washington State. Uh, that got a lot of coverage, but there was also that other attempted shooting at a nice facility in in san antonio texas and the the andy no assault obviously that disgusted many people dayton ohio was a member of antifa too yes so there has been much more scrutiny on antifa who are actual instigators of the violence and because in australia we're called the far right uh, we were affected uh, significantly by the, the Christchurch uh, mosque attack because the killer was Australian and he did it in the name of uh, white nationalism. And so there was a real crackdown on a lot of nationalist and patriot groups here. But we all disavowed him, like said, you know, this is abhorrent what you did. But the difference with Antifa in the United States is the, the ICE suicide attack. He was made a martyr. They said, you know, he was doing a noble thing. Uh, Antifa don't disavow their terrorists. They actively encourage it. Yep. The left pretends that it never happened. And then we get blamed for stuff. Like, I had an interview the other day with, with a big news station that's supposed to come out next week. And they're like, oh, but why don't you disavow white supremacy? And I'm like, okay, I'll do it for you. Are you guys recording? You know, like, I'll do it right now. I, 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 uh, violence, right? White supremacist violence and Antifa violence, I go ahead and I'll disavow those. Like the regular protesters, like Antifa, whatever, if you want to wear a mask and just hold a sign, I don't care what you want to do. Just stand there and hold your damn sign. Not my problem. Not my monkey, not my circus. But the violence is where I find them to be as equally reprehensible. You know, I can go ahead and I can sit here. They won't do this. If you had Antifa sitting right here, they can't do this. I can go ahead and be like, hey, 
I disavow the Dayton, Ohio shooter because he's a domestic terrorist. And then I disavow Antifa because they're domestic terrorists because they try to blow up a, 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 a nice facility. And I also disavow the El Paso shooter, which was a white supremacist. I can do that. They can't. They could can be like, oh, yeah, I disavow the El Paso white supremacist shooter. And I'm like, okay, can you disavow the other two? They're like, I don't know. I'll just like slide off camera. Yeah, I saw your CNN interview with uh, Sarah Snyder. That was done live from the, the Portland and domestic terror rally. And she was basically dying asking you about, you know, white supremacy and ask, ask you about El Paso. And you're like, yeah, of course I disavow white supremacy in the El Paso shooter. And like, you're clearly, because there's this term white Hispanic, but you're clearly a brown Hispanic. Like yeah. your skin color is mm -hmm. visible. And... I, I'm amazed you didn't say to her, like, you know, if I was in that Walmart in El Paso, Texas, the, the, the shooter would have tried to kill me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's true. Now, I, I'd like to have a moment of silence for Sarah, because I completely destroyed her and wrecked her, so I'm just going to bow my head a second. <laughs> okay, I'm done. She tried so hard, and, and, and one of the things that uh, some people didn't see on that interview is that she completely rendered me in, in, invisible. She's like, I've spoken to many, and I hate this term, but I'm just reversing the term so she understands. But she's like, I've spoken to many people of color. Um, and I'm, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you mean like me? Uh, if that's the term you want to use, am I not? Uh, because of my views, do you see me as like a white dude? So I, I, I knew I did all right in the interview. I didn't think I did that good. But then when I watched it again, I'm like, oh. She didn't come prepared for that, you know, at all. I mean, if she wanted to just speak to a, a whiter organization that day, she should have spoken to Antifa. I mean, they're very white. I did not see any, besides the dude that was shirtless, I don't know if you noticed that guy. Oh, yes, yes, he was quite um, uh, visible. I didn't see any other Antifa that weren't white, those black bloc uh, protesters. I didn't see any that weren't white. You know, and you can see what color they are. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell because all you see is like this little area right here. Mm. They're completely covered with gloves and, and masks and stuff like that. We don't hide our face. We put our face right in front of the camera. We don't, I don't care. They're like, oh, well, it's better if you're covered. No, that's fine. If everything were to go south, something were to happen to me because I didn't hide my identity, I'd be fine with that. Now, after that CNN interview, uh, Sarah, she crossed back to the, the studio and now I couldn't find the name of the, the anchor, but I think because she knew that you couldn't respond because the interview was over, she's like, we should remind our viewers that the Proud Boys are designated a, a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And of course she said it like- She did that? Yeah, yeah. Didn't you see the end of that? No, no, I didn't see it. I didn't see that. No, that was right. That was right at the end oh, in the, the the official CNN video that I saw. Uh, what I find funny too is, did you notice when I asked her, I'm like, no, she's she's told me something, and I'm like, well, there hasn't been violence on our side, and she's like, well, there hasn't been violence on the the other side either, <laughs> and like, it's her camera, it's me and her, and then the other side is like a live helicopter view of like this giant riot that's happening like right before our eyes you got to re-watch that so you can see it it is it is insane it's amazing that the the southern poverty law center or as uh, another one of my guests described it the southern poverty lie center like mainstream media still they're the go-to authority for what is a hate group and of course gavin given that well after he quit the Cr proud boys he got fired from his job at, at blaze tv he'd he nearly lost everything, and so he, well, because he's he still got quite a large amount of resources, decided to launch legal action against the the Southern Poverty Law Center. Because if you go on their site, they list so many different organizations as hate groups, like even the the Mises Institute about uh, Austrian economics is is considered a, a far right, dangerous. Uh, organization and so there needs to be more to call that out and thankfully Gavin's bounced back now he's he's got his his new TV platform uh, free speech dot uh, TV he's, he's got Milo and Ann Coulter and a few other media exiles on there so it's good that he's doing better 
Yeah, he's done he's done amazing with free speech TV. It's actually Gavin uncensored like he was before. Um, and I find I find it a lot more entertaining too. And then he's brought in, like you said, he's brought in all these names, uh, Joe Biggs, Milo, and Coulter, Roger Stone. So he's done really good, and that, that again, shows you the sp spirit of the entrepreneur. Now it's his house, he, and he gets to run it however he wants. And how is the, the lawsuit uh, progressing? Because another thing people don't know is the Southern Poverty Law Center is going through internal turmoil with a lot of departures, and they have a terrible internal structure at the moment we'll have uh an update for you guys on that next month it's working out the motors are kind of slow right now because of funding and things like that but i'll have an update for you guys and i'll come back on your show and we'll talk a little bit more about the splc but next month i'll have a little bit more news on that the rally where andy no got assaulted in portland that was the annual patriot prayer rally which is one of the, the local uh patriot groups but that's held every year but the, the Proud Boys decided to go back to Portland earlier this month for this special end domestic terror rally. Uh, one of the things that I, I didn't think that you quite nailed in the interview with Sarah is like, why come back? Like, because you're from Miami, it's on the upper, other side of the country. Why come all that way? Because she mentioned the, the loss to, to business and the, the, the law enforcement expense, and there are also all the other agencies there and your response was oh, i have the right in the united states to travel where i want i think you need a bit more sort of i should have had a bit more of a justification for that yeah what, what i was trying to to say to her at that point was the reason why we were in portland is you said it earlier on the show and I, again i didn't i didn't really there were so many things that we we're talking about that i, I probably didn't say things the right way but um, the reason why we picked Portland is for what you said a little while ago. It's it's the heart of Antifa, you know. It's Rose City. We went to go raise awareness, and and the rally's name is called End Domestic Terrorism. So the heart of Antifa is in Portland, where Ted Wheeler has allowed that to fester. Another thing that I didn't say, I didn't articulate very well, was the two million dollars that was spent wasn't because of us. The two million dollars was spent because of the hype behind this rally, right? Because we decided to have it, and then Ted Wheeler came out and did many press conferences about this rally. He had this big community event where all the business owners came, and he basically he basically told them to shut down their businesses that day. He was putting them in fear. He's like, oh, these proud boys are coming. These, And then he decided that he needed so much for these presents because he had already hyped this up, so the media was taking it. The media was calling him. He didn't know what to do. And he called all the like police, 11 different agencies from across the state, plus the state police, plus the National Guard, the FBI, and a whole bunch of uh, three-letter agencies. And he was the one that cost that city $2 million. All we needed was a small police presence in front of the park. Because all we did was come in, pray, plant our flag, sing the national anthem, and be gone 20 minutes later. If you actually seek out the footage of the, the recent Portland rally yourself, you can see that. Of course, YouTube tries to make it uh, difficult to find, and mainstream media, what they, they snip it up to make it look like, or, you know, violence on, on both sides. But the evidence is it's out there for, for you to view, you know, where all the aggression came from. Our guys didn't even have to defend themselves. We, we basically walked in and walked out unscathed. And we yeah. walked out in the most epic fashion ever. We walked out through this bridge that was completely closed to the public. Police had opened it just for us and it was this awesome like energy power walk, this power march that we had. And it was just, it just felt like victory. It tasted like victory because it was victory. I think if Portland residents, if they're worried about the effect on business and city expenditure, then they should be angry with the mayor for allowing a, a terrorist cell to operate in the in the city and basically plan their acts of violence all over the United States. Yeah. He was so worried about these boogeymen that were coming from across the country to converge on his city and commit acts of violence. He didn't have to look that far. 
He didn't. He didn't really have to be like, "Oh, these people are coming in." He should have been worried about the people within his own city that are trashing the place, beating up journalists, burning cars down, breaking windows, and just destroying the city. And that's why I said we were basically a 500-man spotlight, you know, to shed light on what's going on in the city. And I'm sorry to say it to Ted Wheeler, but we're coming back. Unless he wants to create a, a wall around Portland and declare it a uh, Republic of Antifa. Yeah, he could build a wall. It would be tough for me to jump it. I probably won't go in. I probably won't be able to get in. So that's, a, that's actually a great point. You know, Ted Wheeler, build a wall. And hopefully that would mean the Antifa don't come out. Yeah. Like have, have US border people on the other side. You know what? That might be a better idea than making a border wall with Mexico. Wrap it around Portland and then bring it down past California. And we'll just close off California also while we're at it. So you're actually not too keen on the, the wall because that was what Antifa was, was bragging about in the aftermath that, oh, we raised $35,000 uh, to help Latino immigrants to, to the United States. So suck on that. Yeah, yeah I think that was a complete lie <laughs> like where did they get that money from they're like oh they deposit like i haven't seen like a funding page or anything of how they raise these 35 i mean i might be wrong maybe they did you know maybe they did raise thirty-five thousand dollars. i just i highly doubt that they raised thirty-five thousand dollars. they said that they'd raise twenty dollars or fifteen dollars per patriot that shows up thankfully you raised thirty-five thousand bucks i just I think it's a complete and utter lie. What are the, the Proud Boys' actual views on immigration to the United States? Because obviously after El Paso, they said, oh, uh, Trump is a white nationalist. His immigration policies are about uh, keeping America white. But you know, we've already made clear, and like you're, you're the uh, leader of it, that membership of the Proud Boys that's open up to men biological men of any race or sexuality yeah we don't ask you what your color or religion or where you're from uh, before you join so everybody always asks me like to speak for proud boys like they ask me questions there's some some things i could answer as a group but we don't have that group think mentality that's why i love uh, our organization because it's not it's diverse right so and I don't say that to be a, an SJW, like saying, oh, we're so diverse, because um, I don't even have to say that. That's, that's retarded. We're diverse in thought, right? So like my personal solution on immigration is start. It's, it's a step program because you, you have to do things in certain steps. You can't be like, this is the one, this is the solution that we're going to have. My solution is step one, build the wall and stop illegal immigration, right? As much as you can. You know, they're like, oh, somebody will put a ladder. Okay, yeah, one person will put a ladder. 10,000 people won't put a ladder, you know? Like, who's going to carry a ladder across the desert? Like, it's hard enough to get across and get across the, the river uh, with, like, a 50-foot extension ladder. Well, there was a story um, a few days ago how some illegal immigrants were stopped at the U.S. border because of the wall, and because they were there for so long, that's when... ICE officials were able to identify them, so the war worked. Yeah, of course. So my first step would be build a wall, stop illegal immigration. My second step would be, because you, you can't dig your heels on the ground and be like, this is how it is. I think that we have to open up, not open up our border crossings, but I think we have to open up like some type of visa for like a work permit, you know, so for you to get across so you can work. Because let's be honest, these people aren't trying, like, I'm putting myself in their shoes. They're not trying to cross the border to destroy. They're not trying to destroy the country, you know, but they're crossing the border because they want a better life for their family. They want to send them back money or whatnot and, and just reap the benefits, right? They're, they're doing the best they can for their family, right? So those people that want to come by and work, maybe there's a program. I, I'm not a Profess, uh, professional. I'm not a legislator. I don't know the perfect solution to it, but at least some type of way that we can have people with vetting that we can let them in and work like a work visa or some, something like that, something along those lines. So those are things that, that I think that we need to work together with moderates. 
with a, a common sense solution, but I'm not willing to negotiate without closing that border and stopping illegal immigration. So that first step has to happen in order for all the other steps to happen. Yeah, because you ha if you don't have a proper border, then bad people can just walk in. I mean, the, the great thing about, well, controlled immigration, it doesn't mean end immigration. It just means that you can choose that the right people are coming in. Yeah, of course. So again, like I have zero compromise on that. In order for us to be the welcoming country that we've always been, we have to close the border. No illegal immigration, period. Now, as we've already discussed, uh, obviously, uh, Donald Trump, he is looking at designating Antifa an organization of, of terror, mentioned Ted Cruz, the Senate motion. Neither of those people have, have condemned the Proud Boys, but that probably means that the, the 2020 election race is, is so crucial because obviously we saw what happened in New York. A Democrat president and a Democrat Congress, they could designate you as a organization of terror and and flip the tables and really persecute you yeah yeah it's possible i'm not going to say it's not when they want to when they have something on their political agenda they can't stop it but they're going to have a really tough time doing that with us and they're going to have a bunch of lawsuits if they try to do it to us it clearly states like in our bylaws and it clearly states in everything that we do you know you could you could go through hours of YouTube videos on on us about self-defense. We'll take it to the Supreme Court if we have to. If all of us have to pitch in to get make that happen, we'll make it happen. But um, I don't see that happening. For one, the president's going to win in 2020. But just in case 2024 happens, I don't see it happening. Honestly, I, just, I feel like a lot more Americans are waking up right now. And right now, Republicans should be, even though they should be focused on working this 2020 election, I think Republicans in their mind, they already have, they're playing 4D chess. They're already working for 2024, you know? And if Democrats don't step up, because I think maybe, I think it's likely that we'll see a Democratic president in 2024, but if the left keeps going the way they are, if they don't course correct, they're going to lose in 2024 too. Yeah, if the squad gets any more members, that's going to be a disaster for them. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We're, and the Proud Boys are going to continue to grow. This past week, this Portland event that we had has swelled our numbers. Uh, in my personal chapter, it's increased our numbers by about 25%, if not more, uh, by this time. So we're just going to continue to expand. We're, continu we're going to continue to get bigger. And, you know, who knows when some of our Proud Boys, I mean, we have Proud Boys in Congress, but who knows when the Proud Boys that are now decide that they want to run for Congress, they want to run for to be a congressman they want to run to be a senator you know with the values with our values aligning perfectly with the working class american uh family i won't tell you that it's not a possibility yeah i definitely love that well as i already said you've survived the the worst they've they've thrown everything they can at you over the past year but as you mentioned people uh, are still finding out about the the proud boys and being attracted to it so you're certainly coming up uh, trumps uh, to to use a pun yes yep yep and they say deplatforming works i beg to differ they're talking about us now more than ever oh, well it's been great to to chat to you today and to or you to tell our audience directly what's been going on in the the proud boys and yeah look forward to seeing uh, you out in public uh, again sometime soon yeah yeah you'll see me very soon and i hope to be on your show again and maybe we, we could bring me back on when we have more information on the splc yeah that'd be awesome well thank you for having me i really appreciate it thank you for giving us a voice and uh who's ever watching this you got to subscribe like and share to uh to this channel and that's the show for today there's a lot of other major news stories i'm intending to you to bring you an episode about there's the bolsonaro revolution in brazil the continuing china crisis and the new south wales abortion debate so plenty to stay tuned for 
Don't forget to catch up on the latest episodes of Debt Nation uh, at the Unshackled YouTube channel hosted by my colleague Steel Archer. He continues to keep pumping the episodes out, putting my production efforts to shame. There is also a new episode of The Uncuckables out, which is our joint production with the XYZ and The Rational Rise. It is on its dedicated YouTube channel, broadcast every Thursday night at 8.30pm Melbourne time. And now I'm pleased to announce that you can view the archive of Uncuckables episodes at its new website, theuncuckables.com. And another big announcement is the launch of rationalrise.tv under the direction of James Fox Higgins, editor of The Rational Rise. It is a new video streaming alternative to the increasing censorship and deplatforming on YouTube. It features not just James's content, but also the XYZ back catalogue. Subscriptions, they begin at $5 per month with the proceeds going to support independent media in Australia. Remember to counter the, the fake news and algorithm manipulations, as I mentioned in this show, that is making it increasingly hard for me to find what's really going on in the news, which is why you need to use uh, alternative search engines such as duck.go.com, and for your information needs, uh, please use InfoGalactic. There is also free speech social media, which The Unshackled has a presence on, or you're on gab.com slash The Unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash The Unshackled. We're at mewe.com slash p slash The Unshackled. And we also have our growing Telegram channel, which the, the Proud Boys are on, and we are at uh, t.me slash The Unshackled. Remember for us to stay online and to reach as many people as possible and continue to produce the amount of content that we do. We need your support and of course the best form of support is supporting us financially. We're at patreon.com slash the unshackled. We're also at paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website theunshackled.net slash membership as well as our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also on subscribestar.com slash The Unshackled. And of course, we have our online merchandise store featuring our most popular products at theunshackled.net slash store. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you very soon for the next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.